It's 11.11, make a wish. Hi, and welcome back to part two of our interview with Megan. And as I was editing this, I realized that we actually have enough content for another episode. So the interview with our patient advocate is actually going to be in three parts. And coming up following that, we have an interview with a panel of people. And it's not people you might think that we would choose to interview. But our mission is to uplift marginalized voices. And as such, in this particular community of Ehlers, Danlos, and connective tissue disorder patients, men are disproportionately represented. Now, what I mean by that is not that they're not um, Ehlers, Danlos patients. It's just that you don't see as many men discussing chronic pain um, like you do women. And there's a whole variety of reasons that that might be. But anyway, that's not what this episode is. This episode is the continuation um, of our discussion with Megan that we started last week. And <clears throat> for those on the video feed, you will notice that there was not a video last week. I didn't have the mental wherewithal, or actually physical uh, wherewithal to do what I needed to do to make the video component of it work. I have done that for this week. So this week, your episode will be parts one and two at the same time. Let's get going on our interview with Megan. What I was explaining before to you, um, we use a process of elimination for a lot of things, right? So when you are, are trying to eliminate if you have a bladder problem or a pelvic floor problem or, or what, which part of your pelvic floor is the problem, right? right? So there's a drug called Azo or Peridium and it's over the counter. It's something, you know, makes your, your pee turn orange. You know, a lot of people are familiar with it when they take it for um, urinary tract infections. So if you take that drug and your symptoms go away, you know, it's your bladder, you know, it's something in your bladder that is the problem, right? So if I take that and I still have problems, well, it's probably, you yeah. know, it might for for your case that right. we talked about, it's probably a multitude of different right. things. But you know that if that relieves your symptoms, which symptoms does it relieve? Does it make your adrenaline go away? Does it help you sleep better at night? Because yeah. like like what what things is it impacting? Or is it not impacting anything at all? Right. Right. So and you know, there's another drug we use sometimes called hyoscamine. Um, it actually relaxes all of the smooth muscle and um, your bladder has a lot of smooth muscle. Okay. So if your bladder pain goes away, when you take biostamine, you know that you have like maybe a, a smooth muscle problem. Can you help me understand when you say bladder pain, what does bladder pain mean? Because I hear bladder pain and I, I'm like, don't know what that means. Does that mean always having to pee? Feeling that urgency? Does it feel like someone's stabbing my bladder? Everybody's different. I mean, interstitial cystitis, some patients tell me that they feel like they have razor blades in their bladder. Some patients tell me they just feel like they have to pee all the time. Some people feel so, nothing. Well, so that's, that's my question. You know, if I say I always have to pee, is does that count as bladder pain? I don't it's, think. Because it, it severely impacts my life. Like, I'm, I feel like I'm always peeing. If I'm going somewhere new or strange, I'm worried about where the bathroom is. I have, we went to the park yesterday. I have a pop-up changing tent and a bucket and a urinal with a cup so I can pee because I never know. Sometimes it's good enough. Well, but you also talked about sphincter issues, right? So well, yeah, like I can't, yeah. When like I can't, body, I can't yeah. work. Yeah. So, so in your case, now as an advocate, I can't say, you know, yeah, like there, there's strict lines of what I can say and what I can't say. Right. As as a you are my friend and I'm telling you, you know, your your issues are very complex. And I don't feel that complex though. Yeah. I, don't, no. I, I guess in general, okay, I see. But what I mean is I have multiple is, is there are multiple things together, right? Yeah. And 
the way to, to tease out which thing is you have to be very scientific about you try one thing and then you try another and then you get a test and, and you use all of the information together to try to figure out what the best treatment overall for you is, right? Right. Um, and and I, I help patients navigate, you know, between what they want to do, lifestyle changes, what their doctor wants to do, you know, if, if the doctor isn't ordering the proper tests, like... You know, like like for for in your case, like if you think you have interstitial cystitis, you know, you might want a cystoscopy where they look inside, but you also might just want to get a clinical diagnosis from somebody who knows the disease. Yeah. Um, because the cystoscopy, there's risks to it, right? Yeah. So, you know, um, I, the number one thing people need to realize is the the bladder is one of the places that the mast cells just really attack and can cause interstitial cystitis. So, right. yeah. Um. So that, you know, if you think you have mast cell disease. So what was recommended to me when, when I thought I might have mast cell disease, uh, they told me to try H1 and H2 blockers one to two times a day and a mast cell diet and be very strict with this for a month or two. So a and then low stop. histamine, yes. like a soft to five No, 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 oh, no, 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 different. no, But that's right. also an important yeah. diet to try for people. Um, so yeah, so that was recommended to me. And then they said to stop the cold turkey and see, you know, does your pain get better? Does your pots get better? What, what, you know, what, what do these things do to your body? What impacts do they have? Um, and for me, I, a lot of my pain is not accelerated. <laughs> a ton of it. I, I, I had, you know, all sorts of weird swelling and pain and, and, and issues that I did not think at all could be related to mast cells. And now that I'm on ketotifin and, you know, the mast cell stabilizers, I have a different life. I have a much so ketotifin, how do you go about doing that? So ketotifin is one of those things that's not FDA approved in right. the US, but it's over the counter in some other countries, right. right? It's not a it's not a dangerous drug. It's right. just not profitable for them to bring it here. It's not. Yeah, but this person is going to take it. Mast cell patients, but they don't think mast cell is really, you know, doctors still don't really recognize it as a legitimate disease a lot of times. So they know that mast cells exist. So, okay, funny enough, uh, yes. I'd like, so mast cells are very complex. And when I was in college, I took, you know, and my degrees are in molecular biology, biochemistry, and bioinformatics. And I, (laughs) I, I did some molecular biology research. I did a lot of bioinformatics stuff. Like I did a lot of genome analyzing. Um, but basically I had a professor that, um, he also ran the toss and herpes virus lab and um, had all sorts of really cool viral um, knowledge and oh, vaccine we're gonna knowledge and things. squirrel into one of my special interests about yeah. COVID being herpetic, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, another day. Um, so I sat down with him and I said, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're taking this class, but like, I haven't learned about mast cells. And he's like, you know, mm-hmm. he's like, they're so complex, this would be that, a class. you know, and, and he would sit down with me and talk to me about them, about his knowledge about them. But like, it, it's just not a thing. They go over a lot of these programs. So if they don't like a lot of professors from my understanding, choose not to teach mm-hmm. about it. And because they, I don't think they understand the relevance of them. No. Um, but then if you look, like all allergic conditions have a mast cell component and you have an allergy. Well, I mean, like, they know about mast cells, right? But they do, but so I but get that. Clinical application is just not pertinent to their like practice. But yeah. if, if we, I, I think the research is getting there. Right. So this is that higher really level advocacy that we're talking about. So yeah. have kind of yeah. day to day doctor visit. Okay, fine, whatever. You don't know what that is, whatever. Yeah. But if we make this part of the conversation, there's where the difference happens. I I think that there are a lot of doctors, newer doctors out there um, that that really recognize this. They care. Post-COVID, we've learned that ketotifin is a really great treatment for it. and yeah, okay, so back to how to get it. Um, there's a lot of compounding pharmacies mm-hmm. that make it. If you have a prescription, um, it is kind of expensive to have drugs right. compounded. So there are legitimate ways to get them overseas legally, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and then, you know, 
major manufacturers make it, right? It's not like it's like a, um, but you know, of course, like it's 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 dangerous to not know where you're getting right. medication sources from, right? Um, there are some um, Canadian pharmacies, Japanese pharmacies that have a good reputation that the brand, you know, manufacturers are um, that they get have a good reputation. Right. And, um, you know, I, I work individually with patients that need all sorts of unique drugs that, you know, they get, you know, in different places. Um, there's a lot of things that really need to be tested. Like peptides mm-hmm. could be a really incredible yeah. thing, but we don't, ha- you know, we don't know. I mean, BPC-157, I work with a lot of patients who've had doctors prescribe it. And they've healed their guts. They don't have gas mm-hmm. crisis anymore. They don't have such as a no. So peptides. I've seen collagen peptides that like yeah, but so like yeah, but it, they're they peptides are kind of like a new arena. They can actually change all sorts of all sorts of things in the body. And you know we don't know enough yet. It, it's it's really scary to just buy something off the internet and. You know, but there are compounding pharmacies um, that, you know, are, you know, making these things in a safe way. The question is, are these drugs safe? Who are they safe for? We need a lot more research. Uh, Same with prolotherapy. It's technically still very um, experimental. And if you look at the research for things like that, it seems very biased because there's not a lot of people looking into it. The people that are looking into it are the people. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, but we've done PRP for certain mm-hmm. conditions, like I forget what the condition is. It's not carpal tunnel. I think it's something similar um, for instance to avoid surgery. Yeah. And I think some of those regenerative medicine mm-hmm. treatments are really the way of the future, but yeah. they need to be properly. Right. So, like, if you try it, it's almost experimental within yourself Mm -hmm. so that's one of those conversations that you would have with a patient say like you talked about with like a drug like here are all your prescription options so you could also talk about like procedural or injectable option yeah and the thing is i don't i don't i don't bring up the experimental stuff unless they do i don't want you know i I bring up the evidence-based things like for instance mast cell disease there are these are the you know pops there's these Mm -hmm. are the you know like um, you know, that people want to do. Yeah. yeah. Like, because I don't want to, you know, but there are patients that have tried everything. And now, usually when a patient comes to me and say they've tried everything, they don't know if ketotopin even exists, right. right? Most patients really are well-educated, but a lot of patients think they know all exists because their doctors said, oh, you've tried everything. Mm-hmm. No, you haven't tried ketotopin. That's one of the cornerstones of treatment for a lot of people and the unfortunate thing in the ellers generous community is that we are the resources uh I've so, learned more from patients yeah so is there you know something that uh, a patient has come back to you and said i wish i had come to see you sooner about this or i mean me specifically, but like th- th- I wish I'd known this sooner. Uh, I mean, autism is a huge thing. I had somebody send me a message. Say, so I'm talking to somebody on the internet, and um, this is not a, a patient, but you know, I get this sentiment from patients a lot that you know, I say, you know, you should go to embraceautism.com and take the reds are just to see what your score is because, like, you know, they're telling me how they memorize large amounts of information and all sorts of things that are, are very usually tied to autism. And they told me their score, it's a very high score, and they got very angry. And they got angry at the system right. for, not, for not diagnosing them. For They said, I, I felt different my whole life. You knew I didn't know what it you was. Knew there was and we tried to say you were... A lot of it. Well, a lot of our, yeah. our characteristics were made out to be character flaws. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But not just that, like there's a trust in the medical system that we're taught at a young age that doctors are, they know everything. And, and then we gaslight ourselves when a doctor says, oh, no, you don't have this thing. Mm-hmm. And then. Or we don't even know to ask or to absolutely. be like, this is a weird thing. Right. That this is a problematic thing. Yeah. Especially if that problematic thing happens to your parents too. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I'm glad you brought up doctors. You said if you don't, doctors don't always know. Yeah, they're not trained on EDS and MCAS. So and how do they respond to someone like you? How are they usually receptive? Do they get angry? It depends. I've had everything from doctors just blatantly telling me, I want you to tell me what to prescribe this patient and when. That's outside of my scope of practice. Like I I you know, I I will give them the scientific information and tell them the options. Right. Um, but I'm not going to go outside something ethically, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then I've had doctors be like, yell at me and, and say awful things. And I mean, like, you, you, you so can't it's really imagine. one extreme to the other. But like, you know, you know, who do you think you are telling me what this patient may or may not have and blah, blah, blah. They're just drug seeking and blah, blah, blah. I know what a drug seeker looks like. I mean, like, he is. Yeah, but it's like, crazy. yeah, he does know. He's probably said it to every single ehlers Danlos patient. Yeah. So do most providers react with? like understanding or welcoming to collaborate with you and your patient? It depends. So most, almost all doctors will let me in the appointment. Um, most doctors, it's a conversation where I can speak to the patient and speak to the doctor and chime in and, and help fill in the parts of their story and help the conversation be organized. You, you will know where context is needed in relation to something yeah. that the doctor says the patient might not. Yeah, because yeah. I'll know like what things need to be shared. I usually go over with the patient what we're going to talk about, but then the doctor may have questions that the patient freezes up and can't answer. Right. But I've talked, to, I've talked to this patient for 25 hours before I know the answer to that for yeah. them, you know? Um, also, you're... This is, this isn't your personal appointment. You're there, so you're more sure. regulated. Yeah, but and then you've but, also had a consultation, like you. So you have yeah. a, you have a relationship with the patient Absolutely. to be able to be prepared. Absolutely, and and I always ask the patient what what they're okay with me sharing and not. I mean, a lot of these patients have had intense trauma um, by the medical system, and and they're scared to tell patient doctors certain symptoms because they're scared that the doctors can think they're crazy. Or they've had sexual assault before and they don't want a doctor knowing why they don't want a urodynamic study, right. you know. Um, and that's not uncommon because the statistics of autistic people being sexually assaulted and victimized are yeah. much higher than the rest of the population. Yeah. But I do say most doctors, most doctors, honest to God, want to help patients and don't know how. Or they're stressed out and hamstrung by the system that they're and they're or so they're, they, do they appreciate having a lot of them this really do. To of any good time. doctor really does appreciate it. So when a doctor this isn't part of our healthcare system as like just shouldn't be needed. It shouldn't be needed. Don't we should be able to do this? Think there's like a whole patient advocacy degree program. I was like, what the fuck? Like, is, is this just a product of like? capitalist yeah. Western medicine. Yeah, it's a product of well, several things. The reason patient advocates are needed specifically for elder families yes. is that every doctor, we can't teach all doctors about elder families and the complexity of yeah. yeah, that they need that they need to know to treat us. So somebody like me that does more of a consulting role is is really important. For some of those cases, right. advocates it's not a lot of resources. Like I mean, you said you yeah. know the consortium is just now starting to put out. Oh, I'm doing it for yeah, yeah. Pregnancy, but a pregnancy paper. My youngest child will be 19. Yeah. yeah. So there's CEUs, but is a doctor going to spend their continuing education time on just this one condition? No. Probably. No. So no. so me being a partner, they were in, smart. They were in open you know open. educating them. I think is really important. I think that it's a travesty that I need to be there with a patient just for them to be heard or understood by a doctor and not seen as a drug seeker. I think it's, you know, yes, I think there's always going to be a need for patient advocates with autistic people and, and people who can't really communicate for themselves. And who have we struggle trauma. to perceive and express our symptoms or even know what are, what is happening in our bodies to be able to know if some of the symptoms are i want to talk about red flags potential red flags i didn't know any bad advocates 
I think I said, do, do, do people go into advocacy without no, an advocate's no. heart? Probably. I mean, so here's the thing: there are a lot of them that are not educated in media. So, so there's mm-hmm. a that's okay. So there's a Maryland like Mid Atlantic Advocates Group that I'm part of, and two of us actually have EDS and work a lot with EDS patients, and everybody else just sees them here and there. Um, but so you guys have a a network of advocates, so yeah. then you guys would be like, oh, this is my resource for X, Y, and Z. Yeah, and they call, they you know they come to me and they they ask questions, and and I'm always happy to do co consults and whatever. But you know, I think. Um, you know, absolutely. Just like there's, there are bad people out there. You know, I mean, I think you get the vibes of whether, yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah they if they're trying to diagnose you, and if they're trying to, you know, if they're overstepping their bounds, you can read what their competencies are on the BCPA site, and if they are going outside of their ethical and legal bounds of what they're supposed to be mm-hmm. doing, then you know that's that's up to you if if you're comfortable with whatever they're doing or, or not. I mean, it's, it's and there's yeah, ethics so there's and regulations for a reason, but, um, you know, some patients, you know, need rise to medical appointments and maybe that, maybe that goes against the ethics of, yeah. and it's more of a caregiver, but, you know, sometimes patients need a friend and need a, you know, I don't know. I mean, well, so that's my next question is going to be, what are the actual, do you set your, expectations for the client or patient individually based on what that particular client needs or well I is there anything a patient absolutely should not do like text you at all hours like I mean oh I I mean I'm available 24 7 I don't sleep sometimes no um so yes I I have that's why I would be scared okay yeah I I have boundaries with you know okay well the reality is sometimes my clients need me at all hours of the night. And sometimes you're telling them that well, yeah, I need to go to the ER. Yeah. So uh, let me turn this on again. Um, okay. So the reality is I love helping people. And if I'm up at two o'clock in the morning and they're up at two o'clock in the morning, if they have a question and I'll check my phone is there, I'm going to answer them. But there are some patients I have that do not have self-control issues. And, so you and, have to have more strict boundaries. Yes. Or, or I have to, I mean, I, I, I go out of my way to help some for free a lot. I, I need to be able to set the boundaries of, okay, if I'm going to help you with this, like I actually have to be paid for, mm-hmm. you know, my time if it goes over what yes. we've discussed right. and budgeting and stuff. But if I can't help other people, if, you know, if I don't have, the, if I'm, if I'm using all my spoons, but it's still in somebody that requires you to get an income. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have to pay my mortgage, right. you right. know, whatever. And so, you know, it, it's, it is a lot about personal boundaries and, and professional boundaries, you know, are very important. If you feel like an advocate's not being professional, you know, a lot of people don't, want the professionalism they want somebody to you know for lack of a better term shoot the shit with and and really discuss their pain with and you know really empathize so they need a support yeah on on a more yeah and i just i feel like i have to be as professional as possible while being empathetic and doing what they need and, and really stay within so that really speaks to there's yeah. a lack of support systems for us right yeah i mean there are some patients who you know i think they use our sessions as as kind of a venting and and a support and a healing and i i don't want to think they need to be referred to a mental health specialist mm-hmm. for, for some of this stuff and i i need to make sure that you know i'm supporting them in in mm-hmm. the ways an advocate should so, support them but you know there's a line between yeah. the patient and the yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I've thought about getting a, a license to be a therapist, mm-hmm. too. But, you know, I, I think what I do is if I stay with what I'm doing, I think I make a really good impact. And, you know, yeah. I don't think I need to necessarily do that. And so many of us are called into these helping roles. Like, yeah. And I've had the same thought. I was like, I need to go get my PhD so I can go, you know, do mental health treatment for neurodivergent people yeah. like, that's greatly lacking in trauma yeah. and care. And I was like, no, wait a minute, I'm in the right, I'm in the right seat of, yeah. in the bus. Uh 
so many of us think these things, like going back to school now that I know I can, I can help. I can, and so we but have a whole podcast. Yeah. It is like one of the best, you know, yeah. when you podcast. Yeah. Like we all do. We all have our roles, right? Yeah. And uh, so many younger people I've talked to in our community, they ask me about, well, do you think I can make it through medical school? Do you think yeah. I can make it through genetics? Do you think I can make it through in this I, I think a lot of them maybe aren't considering that as a career, like you, you yeah. found your path in that way. Is it a... I do career counseling for yeah. some people, too. Like, um, there's somebody in my local support group who has a kid that's 18, and they're like, what jobs could she do with pots? And I was like, look, I'm happy to consult with her. You know, like, she could be a receptionist at a hair salon, or, you know, like, I can help give them ideas. I can help write accommodations for school and work and sit... You know, the the, the horrible thing about right. accommodation trying to figure you don't know out what those. exists yeah. at the time, right? Yeah. And that's not how, like, if you go uh, to write it, I know people who know what exists in this. So, like, the school expects you to tell you what the accommodation yes. is needed, and then they don't need it. Anymore. Right. Well, yes. And then they rely on the fact that you'll be too overwhelmed to call them out. Oh, or that the child is too embarrassed by peer pressure to actually want yeah. to take it out. Right. Well, but, you know, with college, for instance, like people don't know that they can take a, in, in some colleges, they'll let you take a test in a room all to yourself, lying on the floor, listening to music. I mean, that's how I went from getting C's to A's in some, because I couldn't, I couldn't take a test in a freezing cold room at eight o'clock in the morning with. I ran out of Stephanie relatives that died when I was in college. So uh, you, I ran out of relatives that died. I made shit up to not go to oh, so I could make it up so, later. I was I made shit up. I was fortunate. I went to a school where we had like an honor system, so we could take wherever we wanted to in the library. We could go take those tests. Mm-hmm. So I would always go hide in the archive, so where mm-hmm. nobody went, because it was. And it's hard when you know the information and you know it so well, but you cannot get it on the paper because mm-hmm. your hip is dislocated right. and you're, you're sitting up, and the POTS issues are so bad that your brain just cannot get blood, and you're like. Why can't I write this email? And it's just, it's a travesty that so many or your people. Hand, I know why Rob did so bad on this SAT yeah. the first time. He had a migraine and like couldn't see the whole time, but he didn't know how to like articulate. Yeah. Remember the little booklets where you used to have to handwrite essays? Yes. The trauma. Yeah. And then like typing, if you could t- just type it, you know, like I, I watched a lecture the other day. Yeah. I'm an information sponge, right? So I'm watching a, a lecture about something online. And the professor tells all the people in the room to put their laptops away because it's distracting him. And I'm like, no, this is awful. These these kids, the, like a normal person, let alone a disabled person, can't use a laptop to take notes. Yeah, like, like this is like the. Uh, that was distracting. The professor said everybody in the room had to put their laptops <laughs> away. Because the laptops were distracting. Yes. I mean, like, people don't know their rights, right? Mm-hmm. You know, like, it's, you know, I, I, in college, I had the PowerPoints printed out ahead of time for me so that I could see them and, and you know, process the information while the yeah. teacher was talking and not, like, not have to worry about my blurry vision of, the days that my pots was so bad, I, I couldn't have. Or the know. fact that I would have, to, I would get in trouble wearing sunglasses in class because the fluorescence made me crazy. Mm-hmm. And I had a history professor like, hey, that was awesome. <laughs> I can't do this. I can't sit here. I didn't, and I didn't know it. It was just like I had learned ways of to self accommodate, but I didn't know I had a right. I didn't know I was disabled. Yeah. Well, people don't know their rights generally medically. Um, and the other thing I, you know, I, I hate assisting with lawsuits um, because I, you know, but, you know, sometimes they really are needed because patients are really significantly harmed. I mean, one of my first jobs was in uh, medical and air research mm-hmm. and uh, things that happen to patients are just, it's really disgusting what happens in the system and how so many different types of systems don't value reporting. You know, it's mm-hmm. punitive when you report right. instead of you know, luckily, I, I worked in a system that, that really cared about that, and they were looking at how to improve medical error because it was the third leading cause of death before the pandemic, Mis- misdiagnosis, delayed diagnosis. So, especially in women, um, you know, 
marginalized people. Yeah. Um, you know, they're for God's sakes, like there's a whole for African Americans, there's a whole different kidney value. Oh yeah. right. But we're finding out now, no, there's not. They're just going into kidney failure sooner. Like, right. you know, like all of these things. That, or when there are actual differences, it's not even taught. So I have a friend who's, yeah. a, he's a black cardiologist, and he, it makes him insane that it's not taught in school that uh, African Americans that are descendants of slaves have a different type of hypertension. Yeah. And it's treated differently. And I have to learn about all these things and advocate for people that, you know, so that they're taken seriously and then they're, they get appropriate help. Before it's too late, you know, for for them to, to have serious consequences, right? So, you know, um, I've had a lot of patients with a lot of weird things happen. And, you know, I, I, I had a patient the other day, um, she had an ovarian torsion. Do you think these things are rare? I've had two ovarian torsions in the last six months of patients that have gone in. But they just, they were going to send them home that they just thought it was their period or a little cyst. And they were... EDS patients? Uh, yeah, both of them were EDS patients, and one of them um, was a younger person, um, had to have emergency surgery, and my role was to make sure she didn't die during surgery, you know, like, the doctors were willing to talk to me about the MCAS protocols, about the, you know, I, I sent them articles about, you know, um, sutures, different types of sutures they could use, things like that, to make sure that the patient you know, didn't go into anaphylaxis, didn't have a dysautonomia and dysautonomia. reaction. Yeah. You know, there's, there's journal articles on these things and mm -hmm. protocols that the doctors... Yeah, I recently had know. to make that call and be like, you need to give this person more fluids. Yeah. Because, you know, the pressures were... Yeah. And that's the thing. They can really harm a patient if they're using medicine to lower their blood pressure if, or make their blood pressure higher instead of giving them fluids because the fluids are the thing that really balances yeah. everything out for these patients so you know and that's that's a family like i'm advocating for a family member like and so so many of us don't have these resources like we we the three of us have clearly made this our special interest but we still don't know everything really yeah and and I, don't claim, but I don't claim to know everything <laughs> At all, and that's and that's another red flag. If, if anybody says they know everything, right? You know, yeah. so I can go to one field. You want an advocate who's willing to say, "I don't know that," or "Let yeah. me look at that," or "Here's someone I can yeah. refer you to that has when experience someone, with that." Yeah. When someone asks me how to find a doctor to treat their EDS, yeah, I tell them, "Well, there's not an EDS specialist. There's very rare that someone's made that their path. You want to find a doctor who's willing." to seek answers and educate themselves. Right. Yeah. To help their yeah. patient. You yeah. yeah. Because yeah. it's not easy to do in this health care system. No, it's not. And you know, I, I want to produce more resources mm -hmm. like, you know, YouTube lectures or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the things that I talk to patients about one on one, you know, a lot more people need to hear well, that. Just the treatment protocols for migraine and EDS for, right, uh, you know, for post -sur post surgical <laughs> treatments for. <laughs> uh, one of my passions is I would just love it if we did co referrals for ADHD and autism every yeah. time we find a hypermobile human and vice versa. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it seems like it's well, obvious to me, but like, that's the thing is like. There's a list of things that I think every zebra should be yeah, the list, looked into, right? The list of I things think everybody should it. take the red czar. It takes 10 minutes to yeah. do online. I think everybody should, you know. Now, there's the thing. As an advocate, I can't say, I think everybody should do this, right? That's not what right. I have to say as an advocate. As a person with EDS that has, you know, that's not, this is my personal know, opinion. Know, right? Let's not stop, just stop at an echo. Yeah. They need to do X, Y, Z. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think, you know, if if yeah. some body like the Elder Stimulus Society or the consortium had a protocol of what to do when you have an EDS, all of the time. If we had a, a treatment protocol yeah. or whatever concern related to EDS, what do you do? or like, this is the list of top referrals or specialties that you need to put on your patient's mm -hmm. team. That would be amazing. Yeah. I mean, we, we tried to do, um, well, um, 
and I suppose the thing do let's talk about food and then I don't know if you could hear Alec there but he was telling us that it was time to eat and so uh, that seemed like another good spot to break and um, this is a reminder that if you haven't eaten maybe you should until next week bye